Okay, moving on to another experienced and well-known speaker who also spoke at the previous QA Challenge Accepted Edition. Alexander Velinov has 20 plus years of experience in software development and engineering web mobile embedded and desktop solutions currently. He is leading the testing discipline of Endava in Bulgaria. Alex will share a potential testing approach about continuous testing at a scale. Please applaud. Ah, ah, ah wait, ah, wait, keep your wait. This is our cable. <laughs> Please applaud. Alexander Velino! You should try and open it, guys. Pretty well. Thank you very much for having me here. Just a minute to... Yeah, I can, I can. Hopefully, hopefully I can. No. Someone lied to me. So is it everything okay now? Uh, I would need to also this connect in this. Mm -hmm. Just another minute. Just let me show the slides. Okay, thank you and good luck. It's okay. okay. Your applause again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I'm, I'm extremely happy to be here for second year in a row. Again, this year I'm going to talk about continuous testing, but this time uh, how we do it at a higher scale when you have, for example, 15, 20, 30 teams working on the same product or program in this case, because, yeah, it's, it's huge. So before we start, uh, I would like first to introduce uh, myself. No. This awkward moment when the presentation is not with you. Okay. Okay, so we continue. Just let me be careful. I'm, I'm switching this time. <laughs> okay, I'm going to switch from my computer. It would be easier, definitely. So first, uh, to start a bit of introduction about me, uh, I'm already six years in Endava leading the testing discipline and also together with my great colleagues we are responsible to grow the Endava business here in Bulgaria. As a whole, I'm from 20 years in the IT field. Uh, my passion toward computers started a long, long time ago. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have ever played uh, Karateka, this 8-bit classic. Oh, I expected fewer. Well done, guys. I'm glad that I'm not so old, but you are. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, everything started with Karateka on the private uh, machine. After that, I moved to uh, newer and more modern games and start uh, soon developing patients towards uh, the system administration networks, etc. And this is how I get my first job. After that, I was uh, freelancing with creating websites. And after that, I moved to the QA field uh, where I spent a lot, a lot of time changing different roles and so on and so forth. Um, what I can say is that I'm really good with working with people. Hopefully my colleagues will also confirm, right guys? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, last but not least, I'm a proud co-founder of my beautiful family together with my wife. We have uh, two kids. And this is recently my hobby. Recently in the last 10 years, but yeah. Uh, don't touch this. 
Okay, so I would like first to introduce you uh, the business trends that we are seeing in Enda, and not only, also in the enterprise world as a whole. And if I can describe everything with two words, uh, this would be first, DevOps, second, Cloud, right? This is impacting our work on a daily basis. More and more companies are trying to migrate and to adapt the uh, DevOps way of working. More and more companies are relying on the cloud infrastructure as a whole, and this is growing as a demand, and definitely we are going to see this in the next years, uh, and this would be the trend. I would like to share here some stats from Google, from the state of DevOps report. It's executed across 30,000 professionals using the Google services, and they have pretty nice ranking. Uh, as you can see, it's, uh, they pretty much ranked the companies into a four major groups. The elite ones, who are the best in the DevOps adaptation, and the high, medium, and low. The guys with the low, it's not easy for them, I'm pretty sure. But what does this uh, rank stand for? Uh, pretty much Google are measuring four major uh, metrics and that's why they have classified the companies in those four uh, major groups. So, for example, the elite group is a, a, a group of companies that are pretty much deploying on demand. This means few times per day if it's needed, they are just pushing the button and deploying. Uh, the elite group is a group of companies that, in case of failure, can recover their services within one hour, which is pretty good speed, and also uh, they need no more than one hour in the moment their code change is merged to their main branch to be deployed on production. It's a pretty good speed. And also the last thing is related to the uh, changes introduced into the life environment and if those changes are uh, resulting in any unexpected issues. So for those companies, uh, this case is very rare. If I can give you an example with the high group, uh, for example, the high group uh, is the point between once per week and once per month. They need around one day to recover their services and they would need around one day to deploy their code to uh, production. So uh, definitely in the next year, I'm going, uh, I'm sure that it's going to continue raising. As you can see from the stats in 2019, the left column in blue, uh, this is the statistic from there, and from 2021 is the red column. So you can clearly see the move, the trend is to uh, shift to left, to the elite group. So this will definitely continue, and this will definitely impact our uh, life as a professionals. The next thing is the cloud. As you can see from the stats, around 80% are using cloud services or cloud infrastructure. 56% are in the public cloud. Uh, around. Close 30% are using private cloud, 34% uh, are hybrid. This means that they are using some cloud services, but they have also a lot of things on premise. And still 21 of the enterprises are still on premise due to different reasons. So from my perspective, this, will, this trend will also continue and we will see less and less companies that are keeping their stuff on premise only. Okay, so going back to the DevOps. Uh, what is DevOps? One pretty smart colleague of me has defined one sentence which is describing the DevOps pretty well. So DevOps is a combination of practices, tools, and philosophies to deliver and operate software. It's pretty clear, right? I cannot say it better, definitely. And here I would like to highlight six practices that are key from my perspective, and not only for uh, the successful adaptation of the DevOps way of working. The first one is the continuous integration. I'm pretty sure you all know about it. You know what it is about. It pretty much gives you, us the confidence of preparing the packages that could be shipped. The next practice is the continuous delivery, the way we are deploying and delivering our software. Of course, here we are talking about automated processes. And the third thing that I definitely believe is also key is the infrastructure as a code. Nowadays, we have very powerful tools that are helping us virtualizing our environments, etc. And thanks to the infrastructure as a code, we can speed up pretty quickly in an automated manner a production identical environments, which is also very useful. And also we can play a bit with the environments on demand if this is required by our process and project. The fourth thing is related to the monitoring, alerting, and logging. And nowadays it's 
very disturbing when you are using a software, you know, the software to stop operating. And for that purpose, we as a software engineers, as a team that are delivering the software and operating the software, we should know uh, when we have a problem before our end clients. And here comes the monitoring and the logging part where you can identify easily by monitoring these walks and also monitoring your systems, potential issues that uh, should be alerted immediately to the corresponding teams to be fixed before the end user understand about it. Uh, the next thing is the collaboration and communication part. It seems that there are in enough old people in this room. So you are, I'm pretty sure you remember the time when uh, everything was in a silos. In the next room are the developers, they are developing their code, they are throwing it to us in the next room, the QAs, we are testing, 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 throwing back, say, hey, please fix your bugs and so on and so forth. And this uh, was causing a lot of conflicts also. Nowadays, we are aiming to work together as a team, doesn't matter the role you have inside, uh, inside the software development, but the DevOps really uh, encourage people to, to work closely with each other, to communicate and to have the shared responsibility about their delivery and their de deploy, uh, development and delivery. And last but not least, sorry, I'm hurrying because we have a lot of things to say, uh, is the modular architecture. Thanks to the modular architecture, nowadays we see more and more demand on the microservices, micro frontends, and those decoupling of the components into certain domains that are living independently. So thanks to the modular architecture, we are pretty much able to achieve uh, a real scale in our software deliver, development and delivery projects. Because earlier, if we have, you know, one big monorep working on it, like three, four, five teams, and the mess is starting. Nowadays, we have many different components which are living independently and deployed independently, and this allows uh, the higher scale development scale. So, in uh, today's talk, I'm going to uh, show you an example of enterprise software in terms of how it's structured. I'm pretty sure that most of you uh, will find some similarities with your projects also. But usually when you have one big enterprise software, uh, it consists of different products. Of course, most of them are hosted in the cloud or using some cloud infrastructure and services. So product one, imagine product one, which consists of a single page application on top. This is our user interface. It could be a monolith repository, like a monolith single page application. It could be a microservices, uh, sorry, micro front ends. So host up exposing different packages. It very much depends on the architecture that you have agreed on your project. After that, uh, we have a lot of microservices on the bottom, which are again living independently in a separate repositories, developed and delivered independently. Some of these microservices, or most of them, are usually exposed through an API gateway and consumed by the single page application, by our front end. But of course, some of the microservices are for internal purposes only, and that's why we usually have a service bus, which is doing the uh, inter-service communication between the different, different not exposed services. Imagine this is the structure of project, product one, we have product two in pretty much the same structure, product three, product four, product five. So this is building like one big enterprise software, like for example, Microsoft Office. And uh, of course, for this high scale and for so many repositories, we will need to think on a bit different approach, how we are uh, structuring our testing and how we are covering all these components with the required tests. Uh, so I'm going to share some insights and some thoughts about uh, how we planned and executed, how we are planning and executed similar, uh, so similar software projects. If you have to remember one thing, uh, this would be remember everything. I mean, you may be useful that you can uh, definitely adapt in your context. So you, what's usually my high-end focus? Uh, it's not only mine, but of course to my colleagues. First is, the first aim is to understand better what we are going to build, what we are going to deliver, and to prepare the testing strategy and approach and the required documentation that will serve as a single point of truth, you know when somebody is asking you something related to the testing, it should be described there. 
Uh, usually this contains like the architecture of the solution that we would need to test, uh, the different, the process that is going to be followed, the different roles and responsibilities involved, the, dis the different test levels, test types, and uh, pretty much how you are structuring your continuous delivery, including do this testing, and but definitely not least, uh, is the onboarding plan onboarding plan together with the training needs because for such high scale pro programs we definitely need to onboard a lot of QAs and we should have a structured approach for this. So don't forget the onboarding plan. After that we are moving to the automation part where we are usually are co concepting our functional automation framework. We think about also the non-functional aspects of the things. We include the performance, the security, you know nowadays these are must. And then we are moving, once we have the concept of the automation, we are moving to the continuous delivery and how we can build it in the best way to, uh, to build and deliver properly our software. So before we start, uh, we have one very important task, to keep the consistency quality across all components. As I described you earlier, you see the picture, every single block is a different component, which is living independently, developed and delivered independently. Uh, so for this purpose, uh, we are coming up to a template. We are using templates uh, that helps us creating the required components. For example, uh, we have a template. It's an automated job that creates from a, a template repository where we have the required structure, all the required linters, unit testing framework, and so on and so forth. Uh, this service. It's pretty similar with the API gateway configuration, with the single page applications, and also with the, our testing frameworks. Because usually we have to have a separate testing framework, which is living uh, together with the um, corresponding microservice or component that it's covering. And of course, let's not forget about the continuous integration and delivery jobs, because this is definitely uh, something very important. Imagine if you have to create the pipelines manually every time when you are creating new components, the DevOps would be very, very, yeah, unhappy. Say it softly. So that's why we can include in our templates also all, the, all required to automatically create the uh, continuous integration jobs and the continuous delivery jobs required for this. So going to the automation testing and the functional automation testing, uh, such context usually requires a bit different uh, architecture of the framework, because usually we, we cannot go with one single uh, monorepo that contains all the tests and, uh, you know, to keep uh, supporting it, because at some point you have like hundreds of uh, components that are living independently, deployed independently, sometimes you deploy like 10 at once and every time you would need to code this repository to execute exactly this test. So that's why we need to have something more flexible and we come up usually to uh, an idea to separate a bit the capabilities of the framework from the actual tests. So what does this mean? Usually we're creating one core package which contains the user interface module, which is pretty much the Selenium wrapper, the API library that we are using for our uh, REST testing, uh, some other helpers that can help you and also uh, you can have another capabilities implemented. For example, if your project requires a database access or pixel perfect or some kind of visual testing, uh, this is the place where you have to implement your uh, needed capabilities. After that, you, we usually have a continuous integration job that is building this package and uh, the outcome of this package is a reusable package that is managed by the package manager that we are usually using. And after that, we can move to the actual uh, testing framework that will contain the tests for the particular application. Of course, this framework is using this core package with all the capabilities as a dependency. And after that, we, again, we have a common, yeah, what do we have in the API template? Usually in the API template, we have an example API test. We have the Docker structure. We have some middlewares. We have a different uh, uh, configurations and readers for the different environments. Yeah, we may have also some shared steps if it's needed. And yeah, some models, of course, that we can use. Uh, 
After that, again, through a continuous integration job, we are building the actual testing framework where we are going to add the tests that are covering the particular application. So, for every API application that we have, we should have a, a living API application testing framework containing all the required tests. So, for example, uh, later in your project, if you decide to integrate another API library that you would like to use or to update the existing one to a newer version, uh, you have to do it only in the core testing framework, rebuild the package, again, deploy the package and use it as a dependency from your end testing framework. What does this mean? Just change the version of the dependency that you are using and you will have the new latest updates. Pretty much the same is applicable also for the user interface template and which is uh, again producing a testing framework that contains the single page application tests. So the user interface tests again that are covering a particular uh, application. Later in the project, if you, for example, see the need of something else to be uh, separated as a reusable package, like for example, maybe many of your uh, end testing frameworks are using some logic to create and onboard uh, different users for your testing purposes. So this again could be separated into a reusable package and used as a capability via the package manager, so as a dependency. So this is about the functional tests, moving to the performance tests. The time is gone. Uh, related to the, yeah, by the way, Bago said that I have five minutes more from him. So if you're too hungry, blame him. Uh, so usually for scope, uh, in terms of performance testing, we have a baseline test, we have load, stress, capacity or different types like SOC, uh, volume, scalability, or whatever is needed in your context. But something that I would like to highlight here is the baseline test, which is a must from my perspective for your continuous integration and delivery pipelines, because pretty much those are fast, uh, pretty quick tests that are uh, loading your microservice, with the, for example, with 10 transactions, with every, uh, new, when every new uh, code change is uh, deployed. It runs those tests, it gathers the metrics, and it pretty much uh, validates against the previous executions. If it has a big uh, deviation of the response times, then it should be something that you should pay attention on and also investigate. So, uh, usually in order to do a load and stress test, we would need a bit different setup from our local machines or a virtual machine in the cloud because uh, it's not scalable enough. Uh, that's why we are usually using the JMeter and the uh, concept of distributed testing, where we uh, pretty much set up one uh, Docker container with the controller node. So this is like the server instance of the JMeter, from where we are commanding the worker nodes. Uh, these are the actual nodes that are executing the tests. So through the controller node, we are saying use these worker nodes and execute the tests to, uh, to cover the corresponding website. Uh, after that, you can also easily, because there is pretty easy implementation with InfluxDB, you can easily store your metric inside InfluxDB and use, for example, uh, Grafana, because there is also pretty straightforward integration between both. Uh, to visualize your uh, results and also to prepare any type of dashboards that you might need for, for your uh, stakeholders. Of course, everything, everything this in run in a Kubernetes cluster. Yeah, you can assume it from the images that you are seeing. So this is pretty much uh, related to performance testing. Moving to the security testing. Again, very important, very crucial part of what we are doing. Usually in scope, we have four major types of tests that we are doing. The first one is the static code analysis. It's pretty straightforward. Like uh, most of the linters are doing this. Uh, I would name here Sonar. I think it's the most used one. And uh, thanks to this, uh, you are able to identify uh, potential code vulnerabilities that you have inside your code. The next thing that I would like to highlight is the software composition analysis. Uh, nowadays, I'm sure that even most of you are using a lot of open source libraries to speed up uh, your development. That's also pretty applicable for every aspect of the software development. And it 
this software composition analysis is pretty useful for that purpose to manage our open source, source dependencies. Thanks to this uh, um, scan, uh, we have uh, a clear visibility of what are all our open source components that we are using in our system. We have the license agreement of every component, the actual version that we are using, the known vulnerabilities, because your application might be uh, penetrated via your third parties, who knows. And of course, it contains also suggestion on how to fix those uh, open source vulnerabilities. For that purpose, in Endava, we are using Black Duck, which is a pretty powerful commercial tool. But if you don't have the budget for this, you can use uh, the OASP uh, dependency check. It's an alternative open source, which is, I believe, truly uh, pretty useful and easy to be configured. The next thing that I would like to highlight is the UI and the API passive scans. Um, for them, we are mainly using the OASP uh, uh, ZEP, Z Attack Proxy tool. What does this mean? Pretty much it, when you are executing your functional tests, for example, you have already developed some functional tests, some user flows that you're going through, you can configure ZEP uh, uh, to uh, to act as a proxy in this case, in this execution, and to pretty much track all the traffic through the HTTP. And after that, it gives you uh, potential vulnerabilities that you have inside your configurations, potentially wrongly exposed data inside your uh, header body, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, ne the next type of test that I would like definitely to recommend you to start using is the active scan. This is pretty much like an automated penetration testing that is trying to, again, based on the traffic that uh, Zap has recorded from your functional test, you can configure after that Zap to try to penetrate uh, the same flows with generating uh, different and fake uh, requests. Uh, of course, this uh, type of testing uh, results usually in a lot of junk data inside the, uh, the database, but we'll talk about this a bit later. So going to the continuous delivery approach, it's really nice to have all the automation in place. It's really nice to run it uh, you know, with one click, but we have to have a, a proper process to deliver our software. Here I would like to highlight a, one example pipeline. Um, you can use it to adapt it for your context or you can come to something completely different. But yeah, usually we have the continuous integration process and think, as we said, thanks to this process, we're aiming uh, to build in an automated way a reliable package that could be shipped. So as part of this process, we definitely should have a configured quality gates. Usually the quality gates are checking your code against the unit testing coverage, against newly introduced uh, code issues, against duplicated code, against technical depth introduced, and so on and so forth. So you can control everything this through your quality gates and can put uh, some thresholds that cannot pass. After that, we have usually the unit testing execution. Again, all your tests should be green in order for you to continue building your package. And at the end, we can put here also the software composition analysis that I uh, just described. So in case this analysis finds a new library with new vulnerability that you are using, major or critical, it can again fail the continuous integration process. But yeah, assuming that everything is passing, we have already the package prepared and ready to be deployed. For our purposes, I, I've decided to use three environments. In the reality, could be four, could be two, could be, who knows, could be on demand. So yeah, it depends. In our case, the dev test environment is using for development testing pr purposes. The pre prot is similar to the production, identical, I would say, and the production is pretty clear. So usually, we aim to have as uh, Mitko said, to try to shift all the verific verifications and validations to left. So usually we are aiming to have our intensive testing on the lower environment. In this case, we are running our full regression test of our API or UI, depending on the component that we are testing. Uh, we, are, we have here set up the performance baseline test that I described what they are doing, and we have the act active scans here. Again, you should be very careful with the active scans because they are gen generating a lot of junk data and they are also impacting the usage of the environment. So you should do it in a controlled manner. 
on a nightly basis and after that you have to clean up a bit the database. So it, you can input here also another testing types that are required for, for your context like accessibility, cross-browser platform, I don't know what else might be needed. Going to the pre-production environment. Once we pass through all these steps, we are uh, going, we are deploying on pre-production and running our sanity tests, which is a relatively small pack containing only the important, the business critical functionalities as a test. Uh, and after that, we can do uh, here our J-meter uh, load and stress testing. Why here? Because usually pre-production is not so used environment. And again, when you are doing a load stress, etc., you are impacting very, work, very much the work of the others. You know, the system start being um, responsive or sometimes even somebody is trying to do something with the system or deploying something on the environment. This uh, usually uh, impacts your results and you have to rerun again the test. Uh, here we can have also the passive scans because we believe that pre-production is similar to the production. So any configuration issues that we might have in our services could be caught here very easily. And if everything is okay, we're moving to production where we usually have a smoke test pack, which is which purpose is just to validate that the deployment is successful, and we can go with that version of the software. So this is a nice. I would say nice pipeline, but again, here key is to, uh, to enforce your testing and your checks as part of this pipeline. So make sure that uh, your deployment jobs, for example, if somebody of your colleagues would, would like to deploy on pre-production and, you know, usually he just need to go and to click a button and the software goes to the pre-production. Make sure that you're configuring your uh, pipeline so that before that, uh, the job is checking that your functional performance and security tests are passing. Otherwise, your colleague should not go to the production since it's a bit risky. So for this purpose, uh, I would definitely recommend you to uh, implement your quality gates and to force them, you know, if your quality gates are not met. So for example, if the newly developed code has a lower, uh, lower unit testing coverage or has new uh, code issues introduced, just stop the process and fix it, <laughs> fix those issues. The next thing is the functional test. They, they should be passing on 100%. I know for user interface, it's not so easy. Mutko talked about the flake test, so I hope you learned a lot from him. But if you have such flake tests that are not working, try to remove them from these automated jobs and execute them earlier during your development to make sure that everything is working. Uh, after that, try to uh, enforce your security scans. In case you find a new um, major or critical vulnerability, again, just stop your deployment process. And something uh, similar also for uh, the performance testing. If you're seeing a performance degradation caused by the newer version, just stop it and investigate it. Nobody will die if you don't deploy your code today, you know. So, uh, I'm completely over the time. So, I would like just quickly to recap everything what I said. First, focus from the beginning on the uh, all quality attributes that you have uh, of your system that you need to develop and all the required testing types also include the performance and security. I'm pretty sure even if you don't have them in the beginning as a need from your clients, they will start asking at some point about them. The next thing is rely on automation. Automate it as much as possible from your testing and from your delivery process. And at the end, just enforce the quality. You know, don't count on the goodwill of the people that, you know, before I deploy, I will go to run the tests. This very rarely happens. So enforce them. So that was from me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It, it was a hard start. Uh, your applause for Alexander Bellino. You can find him and ask questions him in the coming breaks. And before we go to lunch, a very, very important, important announcement in the agenda. The last talk planned for today, Netko Christoph's talk, is cancelled. 
Therefore, we are making the following change in the, in the agenda. The last talk for the, for the day will be given by Natalia Romanska, finishing at 4.30 p.m. After that, there will be a long beer break until 5 o'clock. Know that the raffle of Zeeburger will not be at 5 o'clock, but at 4.35. I repeat, Zeeburger raffle will be at 4.35. Then at uh, five, uh, five o'clock, we do everything all together. Lightning talks, QA of the year, the year award, and, and the, the final raffle of, of our sponsors. In short, 4.30, beer break, five o'clock, closing ceremony, uh, and, and the delicious sandwiches uh, waiting for you outside are provided by Nuve. Nuve! Third year in a row. Each sandwich is color-coded as follows. Red is for pork, blue is, blue is for turkey. <laughs> Yellow is for vegetarian. I'm vegetarian. <laughs> and green is for vegan. <laughs> okay. Meat lovers, please do not eat uh, the vegetarians and vegans uh, sandwiches because uh, we don't need, uh, think the opposite needs announcing. Thank you. So, bon appetit. appetit. Oh. Mm -hmm.